What advice do you have for the patient that has a closed lock? They can't open their mouth all the way. Well, number one, you never force it. Okay, you, you never force it open. Okay, the closed lock is, there, there are two ways of defining locking. Okay, if you go to the joint itself, the disc can dislocate in front of the bone and stay stuck out front, mm -hmm. okay? And there are actually two subsets of those patients. They can be, it's Piper stage 4B typically. They could be a 4B disc with restricted range of motion. Right. Okay, that's the classic TMJ locking. But what's interesting if you ha is that there are actually a lot of patients who are 4B without restricted range of motion, okay? So locking in and of itself um, may, be, may be a disc displacement, okay, but you can have totally normal range of motion with a displaced disc too. I had a, a gentleman one time who could open 70. Wow. Now 40 to 50 is normal. Sure. He could open 70 and both discs were locked. You know, his, his tissues were that loose that he could do that. So a closed lock, if, if somebody gets an immediate closed lock, it could be mechanical locking of the disc. The other one that I'm not so sure that it's not more common is sympathetic input, mm -hmm. okay? Sympathetics tighten all the muscles. And we, we have more muscles that close our jaw than open. And if you get a dystonia or spasm, in the muscles that close the jaw from a sympathetic nerve problem, hey, that closed lock may not be a mechanical lock in the TMJ at all. It may be the sympathetics. A dystonia. Okay. A dystonia. Results in a sympathetic input. Right. Correct. Yeah. And that could have occurred because of a dental procedure or because of, you know, you have a car accident or something like that and it turns all the sympathetics on. So in the, in the ideal world, one would order imaging take a look at what the discs are doing, correct? Well, you may not do it that quickly. Yeah. Uh, in, in the ideal world, you would focus on calming the sympathetics. Greater auricular nerve block. You could do a greater auricular nerve block if, if the patient can get in for access. Um, other ways of, of improving muscle um, tone would be to increase circulation, okay? Uh, laser therapy. Could be laser therapy, it could be a heating pad, it could be moist heat on the neck. Sure. Uh, most people do the wrong thing when their sympathetics get active. They stop functioning, okay? So let's say you have a whiplash injury in a car. You don't hurt till the next day, and then everything hurts. It's generalized. You, know, you feel like you've got the flu in, all, in your whole body that's probably a generalized sympathetic response. So what we do is we withdraw from activity. What they should really do is sweat, okay? Sweating is regulated by sympathetics, and so if you're active to the point of sweating, mm -hmm. now you're retraining the sympathetics to do what they're supposed to do. You know how interesting when I have a patient that I know that I can help greatly, and perhaps they might benefit by surgery, they elect not to do so. It's almost invariable. They go off and they find yoga, or they find aerobics. They find something that makes them sweat. And they come back a year later or so, and they'll tell me, you know, the only thing that kind of keeps it under control is the exercise. You know, so we think so. it's endorphins, right? Mm -hmm. We think, okay, you're exercising and uh, your endorphins are controlling your pain. Yeah. And that's true, but that's, this narrow perspective here. Sure. The other perspective is, again, we've got more than one thing happening when we exercise. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're helping train the sympathetic nerves to react the way they should react, if you're stimulating the body to sweat some every day, now it's almost like nerve retraining. And I, I have a lot of chronic Crips patients uh, who are totally inactive. Yeah. Okay, 
And if you can convince them to become more physically active, don't think endorphins, think about sweating. Yeah. And, and for them, it may be walking outside and they're gonna sweat. For others, it may be you've gotta walk 10 or 15 minutes sure. before you break a sweat. You wanna start that kind of training every day. Will heat work? Yeah, I mean, you could go to a sauna and you could sweat that way, but I think I'd rather have them also making their heart uh, respond to sympathetics and drive the sympathetics. So you gotta exercise. You gotta get your heart rate up as well, and that's gonna be raised by the sympathetics. Passively sweating, in other words, is not as beneficial to the patient as more active sweating. Mm -hmm. Got it, yeah, okay. that's important.